So let me spend a little time just giving you some examples of where we are taking low value waste type feedstocks and turning them into useful products. And we start off with one of my favorite areas, which is an area where uh, Vanya, who's coming to join us next year, is going to be working with us. And that's on the use of waste polysaccharides. And in particular, to take waste polysaccharides and make porous solids. So these are porous solids. Porous solids are things that have a good surface area and a high pore volume. This is ordinary potato starch, pea starch, wheat starch. They're all very similar. They're all materials with a very low surface area, a very low pore volume. Therefore, as a material, they're not very interesting. But if you modify them physically, if you cook them, really, it's cooking. When you cook them, you open up the structure and you make something which is porous. Now, that's really much more interesting. The trick is to be able to keep it in that state because it's not its natural state. So you have to be able to um, basically take the water out without the structure collapsing. And that's not so difficult. You can just exchange the water with ethanol, for example. Anyway, in that form, you can do lots of things then with these waste polysaccharides. For example, you can chemically modify it, and then if you chemically modify it, it becomes more organophilic or more hydrophobic, and you can then start blending it into mixtures. For example, you can make new adhesives, and so-called switchable adhesives. And we've been using that for carpet tiles, working with the world's biggest uh, carpet tile manufacturer. And the idea there is that we want to be able to make future carpet tiles held together. These are full of adhesives. We need those adhesives in the future to be bio-based. We need them to be biodegradable. We need them to be based on low-value feedstocks and ideally switchable. Because if they're switchable, it means that we don't have to throw the carpet tile away when we finish with it. Because at the moment, when we finish with carpet tiles, and you probably don't use that many carpet tiles in Brazil, but in North America and Europe, we use a lot of carpet tiles. They end up in a big landfill site because you can't recycle them. Now we can. We can use switchable adhesive technology based on waste polysaccharides to make carpets which can be used, the components of which can be used again and again. We can take the same technology and we can make what we call star bonds. This was a discovery, a classic example of a, of a serendipitous uh, scientific discovery. We found that if you take that high, pores, that high surface area starch, the porous starch here, and you heat it up, it shows very different behavior to ordinary starch, and it becomes carbon-like. It's still mesoporous, but now it's got carbon-like characteristics and all sorts of interesting properties, allowing all sorts of different applications. Let me just quickly go through some. So here is the possibly the most interesting property feature, and what it shows is it shows you that star bonds are all mesoporous. That means the pore sizes are about 10 nanometers, maybe 20 nanometers, but they're pretty big. They're bigger than zeolites, for example. But the carbon-oxygen ratio, which is all about the surface polarity, that can be anything from very high to very low, very polar to very polarizable, very carbon-like to very starch-like. They're all possible, but all the time it's mesoporous. Now, because of that, you can use the materials for various applications, for example, for adsorption. So we use star bonds for adsorbing small molecules, like aromatics, which are used in many industries. And this just gives you some data about how the star bonds, depending upon the type of these, are different types of star bonds. And they can bind these molecules with different efficiencies and at different rates as well. Sorry, the color hasn't come well here. But these are very important commercial dyes. So uh, you're all wearing these now, I suspect, because it says here 50% of the cotton market is actually based on these four dyes. These are huge molecules, which are called reactive dyes, that you put onto the fabric, like your cotton tops, your trousers, and it fixes a color onto the fabric. Now, that sounds really nice. We all like color. We like to wear color. We like to buy color. But the problem is that all that lovely color that we like to see comes at an environmental cost, because 
where they create the colors, where the dyeing industry is nowadays, is places like Bangladesh, Pakistan, parts of India. And the local environmental control is really, really poor. So the people there are living in very dangerous conditions. They all have terrible stomach problems. They have enormous pollution problems. And that's because, you know, we want cheap clothes. We like cheap clothes with nice colors, but we don't think about the consequences. We need to find ways to help countries like Bangladesh to process its industry in a cleaner, greener, safer way. Typical green chemistry. So, for example, Starbonds are really good at absorbing these very big molecules. Remember, these molecules are like six, seven, eight, nine rings. They're huge molecules. Something like activated carbon will only absorb, in fact, one of them well. The rest, it only absorbs a little bit. Most ordinary star bonds are not very good, but these types of star bonds are good, this one in particular. And this type of star bond, A, stands for alginic acid. That's seaweed. So in fact, we are using natural polysaccharide from seaweed to make these star bond materials. We think seaweed's really exciting. I'm sure Brazil's got lots of seaweed. You have a long coastline, so you must have lots of seaweed. Many countries have a lot of seaweed. There are people now farming seaweed to extract the alginates for additives for food. But most of it's, again, a waste. And we see tremendous opportunity for using that seaweed as a source of polysaccharides, for example, for making star bonds. They would also absorb and desorb small molecules very well. And they can also be used for separations in chromatography. And this is a very nice area. This just shows you some very early results comparing a, a commercial porous graphitic carbon column for liquid chromatography of some sugars. And this is the non-optimized star bond. And you can see that the resolution is not as good, but the separation is happening. That's really important. This material will cost you a lot of money. It's got a very high environmental footprint because of really high temperatures they use to make it. This is much greener. So we think there's a lot of potential there for using starbond type materials for separations. You can also use it for capturing metals. We talked about metals before. Starbonds will capture metals. This shows you how starbonds capture certain metals like lithium, cobalt, gold. Remember I talked about lithium being increasingly important. Gold is one of the scarce elements. And these are absorbed very, very well from complex mixtures like in so-called red mud. Red mud is the waste you get when you mine aluminium. You've got aluminium in Brazil. When you mine aluminium, you make red mud as the waste. And it's full of metals. And we want technologies that allow us to get those metals out of the mud because otherwise they cause environmental problems and we need the metals for all the industries we've been talking about before. You can also take the star bonds with metals attached and use them to make catalysts. And we can also, before we even start to think about, you know, sort of what to do with the bulk biomass, we can think about extracting chemicals from the surface. So when you are next outside in your garden or going for a walk or all this wonderful biomass around you, feel the surface of the plant. And what you are feeling is you are feeling chemicals. And we often call those waxes. They are chemicals that nature uses to cover the surface of its leaves and its bark and roots and so on. It covers them in a way that allows nature to work, to allow water in, water out, flies in, flies out, all these kinds of things. It's a very interesting formulation of chemicals to allow you to basically get what nature needs to do. And these are the kinds of molecules you will see on the surface of, for example, uh, wheat straw. We have a lot of wheat straw in the UK. We've done a lot of work on wheat straw, working with people like Croda, a big biochemical company, and the famous cosmetic company L'Oreal. And these are chemicals you can extract from the surface of things like wheat straw using carbon dioxide. Now, carbon dioxide, which of course is, uh, you know, so many people think of as being the big problem. It's in the atmosphere. It's causing global warming. Yeah, absolutely, it's a problem. But it's also a really good chemical. So why not use some of it, for example, as a solvent? You can make CO2 liquid, and then it's a weak solvent. You can make it supercritical then it becomes a little bit better as a solvent. You can add some ethanol, then it becomes better again as a solvent. And you can use it for extracting a lot of chemicals off almost any type of biomass. And the amount present on the surface of biomass can be quite high. 
Normally, it's one or two or three percent of the weight. Sometimes it can be up to 10 percent of the weight. Very interesting. But as a solvent, CO2 is great for this. But as a solvent, for example, for doing reaction chemistry, making the pharmaceuticals, for example, I was telling you about before, it's not such a good solvent. But we know we have to find greener solvents. We know we cannot carry on using petroleum solvents, many of which are being restricted or banned. We know that the natural solvents like CO2 and water are not good enough. And we think there's a great potential for using bio-based solvents. So back to biomass and the things you can make from biomass. We can make, of course, you make bioethanol that's better than anybody else in the world. You can make esters. You can make derivatives of common molecules. You can make sirene, which is a new, a new uh, molecule we make in two steps from biomass in collaboration with a company in Australia, actually. And we can make limonene, of course, from citrus waste. All of these are very useful solvents. And we need to make a lot of new green solvents because if you think about all the chemistry where we use solvents like reactions, amidations, esterifications, we need solvents. Limonene and simine do these reactions really well. You could even use a nice silica catalyst to make the process very green. These solvents are as good as things like chlorobenzene, toluene, dioxane. These are the old solvents, but we will not be able to use those in the future. Legislation is going to make it really difficult to use those solvents in the future. And if you think about all the different types of solvents we use on this solvent polarity map, you can see amines and phosphines and dipolar aprotics and ethers and esters and carbonates and nitriles and alkanes and halogenated compounds and aromatic compounds and nitro compounds. The, we all use all of them. We use an enormous range. At least 200 different solvents are commonly used in the chemical industry and in chemistry laboratories. And many of them are not environmentally acceptable and will be severely restricted. We need alternatives. There are not many available. So in this rather poor green, in fact, I've got sirene I mentioned before, you can get bioacetone. 2-methyl-THF is bio-based. You could make esters are bio-based. Limonene is bio-based. Simene is bio-based. Maybe we can make some bio-nitro compounds. Maybe we can make some bioamines. Nobody is making them at the moment. We are trying to help, working with lots of different companies, to create a new family of bio-based solvents. And also trying to help people to understand what they want a solvent for. Very important challenge for the future. <clears throat> we also like taking other technologies for getting chemicals from biomass. So, as I said, we can extract the surface chemicals using CO2. And then, of course, you are left with the bulk residue, maybe 95% or something like that. Of, you've still got left, the bagasse, if you like. Uh, what do you do with that? So people do fermentation technology in this university. I know they do that. But there's another very important technology, more chemistry-based than biology-based, which is thermochemistry. And in particular, we like microwave thermochemistry because we think it's very powerful for biomass conversion. And it's based on the idea that actually you can use microwaves to give you very efficient, <coughs> very homogeneous heating, very quick heating of biomass. Because if you take biomass like sugarcane gas or orange peel and you use conventional heating methods, you get very, you don't get uniform heating, you get hot spots, you get all sorts of complicated things going on. But with microwaves, we can get effects at much lower temperatures. And we think that's very powerful. We can use the microwave method to take biomass and make oils, make pyrolysis oils, which is the chemicals you can make, and make a char, which can be used, for example, for energy purposes or for soil enhancement. And this shows you some of the primary data which demonstrates why the microwaves are very powerful. So for example, here's wood, and you can see the conventional methodology. This is what happens if you heat wood up, and you start to get uh, uh, products coming off at around 250 degrees or thereabouts. Under microwave conditions, it's, it happens at a much lower temperature. And you can see the origins of that with cellulose and hemicellulose. The microwave decomposition process occurs at much lower temperatures than conventional heating. 
So we recently took that to prove that you could make fermentable sugars in a paper we published just uh, a couple of issues ago in JAX. And that shows you that under conventional conditions, the most you can hope to achieve is 1 or 2% of sugars. But under microwave conditions, 20% is possible. In fact, we can do better than that. So it's very interesting to see that by changing your decomposition technology, you can make a much more efficient use of the biomass as a source of feedstocks for making chemicals. Just to end up with a few examples, our friend Orange Peel I've mentioned before. I thank Brazil for this because my first idea about this was in Brazil driving around Sao Paulo State and seeing all these tankers going by with orange juice and thinking, where are they all coming from? And talking to people like Igor Polyakovov here about, well, there must be some big industries here making uh, orange juice and therefore they must also be making all sorts of waste materials. And that got me thinking and I went back to Europe and talked to people in Italy and Spain and also in Turkey and Northern Africa and more recently in places like India and China. There are many places in the world that grow oranges, around about 100 million tons a year. It's an enormous commodity product. And a lot of it's wasted because they squeeze and they don't use the residue for much, if anything at all. You can take microwave technology, you can make sugars, as I said before, you can make bio-oils containing very useful chemicals, like limonene, you can make pectin, which is a very useful product in the food industry, and you can make mesoporous cellulose because of the structure of the pith and the peel. And we are now working with a big German company to create what we hope will be the world's first orange peel by refinery. Take something of very low value, and make lots of things which have real value and use. More generally, just with microwave technology, you can make a range of products from all sorts of different types of biomass. It's energy efficient, it's been proven at scale, and it's something we think has got a great future for biomass conversion. Another project which takes the biochar, you burn the biochar, you make ashes, the ashes are full of silicates. So for example, rice straw, Rice straw, when you burn the rice straw, you make ashes which are very rich in silicates. Those silicates are a really good adhesive. They are biosilicates, and they can bind together straws and grasses to make furniture. And I got a message this morning, in fact, from my colleagues back in the UK, and we've now made our first kitchen cabinets. So the idea here was to make future kitchen furniture using 100% waste products, entirely green and sustainable. And we had them made in China, like everything else these days, using our technology. They've come back to the UK, and apparently yesterday they were looking at these, and they've now been made into kitchen cabinets with door handles and hinges and everything for proper testing. So we're very excited about the possibility of a future generation of furniture based on food waste. So, you know, you can eat in the kitchen, which is made from food waste. You can make porous solids from the same source as well. 